Hello, Thank you. good afternoon, everyone. It's great to have you back for another Tech Tuesday. <clears throat> uh, today, we'll be talking about what's new from Eris and recapping some things uh, that some customers have been asking us the last uh, last couple of months since our last Tech Tuesday. So, um, I'm excited to be joined with Milana Brodovich and Julianne Grant, who are helping us run this webinar this year. Um, just a few quick housekeeping things to cover. Um, today, we'll do as we have in the past. We'll take some questions in the question poll during the event. I will try to facilitate picking those up and giving a response. Um, if there's anything there we want to kind of rehash as we get to the Q&A section of the webinar, then uh, we'll bring those things up and can have good general conversation. So with that, I am going to hand it off to Milan. All right. Thanks, Rodney. So like Rodney mentioned, uh, first things first, our goal here is to go over what's new in Innovator 26. Um, and then we're going to kind of go a different direction with this Tech Tuesday. Um, for those of you who are new, and plus, like Rodney mentioned, we've been getting a lot of questions about um, people are interested in upgrading to a newer version of Eris. Um, and I figured we get a good recap of what's been released since Innovator 14. So we have a nice place for everyone to go back to or learn about um, all the new functionality that's going to be included with your upgrade. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's get into it. So the biggest addition to Innovator 26 um, is tooltips for properties and grid forms. So, or for search grids and uh, item forms. So there's two new attributes that have been added to item type properties. Um, and these are going to be help text and tooltips. And basically the goal of these are to provide contextual help for properties in forms and on search grids. So if you look to our right here, we have a couple examples here. Um, as we look at our properties, we have these two little question mark icons um, that appear now. So when you add this attribute to a property, for example, type or description here, um, it will provide a brief description of the property or whatever information, information you really want to include in that little text box. So with help text, this question mark will bring up an hyper, a hyperlink and will open up a, a window. Um, and then with the tooltips, um, it'll just be a small dialog box. So this functionality also translates to the search grid as well. Um, as you can see, the type property maintains its same uh, sort of question mark icon that shows up right after the property name as well. So in this case, if I were to click on this property, uh, it would pull up the same uh, dialog box as uh, on the form. So with that, um, Innovator 26 was a rather light release. Um, and this was the kind of key functionality that was added. Um, obviously useful, but um, there's not much more at the moment to talk about for Innovator 26. So now we can go ahead and transition to our kind of big recap of everything that we've seen added to Innovator since the advent of 14 and upwards. So I started by creating this very long list of notable improvements and additions since 14. We've seen a lot of new and exciting features being added, such as two new platform components like variant management and the process engine, um, another major component in terms of the new dashboarding functionality, and then also countless enhancements to 3D visualization, the overall UI and user experience of Eris. Um, the Office Connector, MPP, and the TechDocs framework have also been pretty big focuses. And then we've also had some pretty notable changes to the platform in terms of uh, what's required to really run Eris on the back end. So for the next uh, portion of the webinar, I'm really gonna focus on what you may have missed or what has been released since uh, 14. So first things first, we have variant management. Um, this was introduced initially for Innovator 12 SP18. Um, and then finally introduced to the 14 plus platform with Innovator 22. So variant management, really the goal here is to provide the ability to manage your variability in one place. So you can use the variant management tools for definition, uh, validation, and the resolution of your configurations using their configurator tool, which is shown here on the right. So later on, we can go through and click through this again, just for a quick review. Um, but in a quick summary, um, as I would make selections in this configurator tool, it would show me compatible options or it would eliminate options based on selections. 
So a good thing to note, uh, the next update that we're looking at for variant management should be in Innovator 27. So we'll be getting new functionality for that soon. Um, so we'll also have a little more in-depth breakdown during that webinar as well. Following that up is the ARIS process engine. Um, this was initially introduced for Innovator 18. Um, and really, the introduction of the process engine allows us to create Processes, automated processes and tax, task automation definitions. So with the initial release, um, ARIS really wanted to introduce the base data model to create these task definitions and process more like simple batch scripts. But on, our, on their future backlog, there is a lot more that ARIS is intending to do with the process engine, and we're looking forward to getting that information over to you guys as soon as we can. Along with that is dashboarding, which was introduced in Innovator 21. Um, so dashboarding introduced uh, the configurable dashboard framework, which really allows for creation of interactive dashboards. So if you're on our Innovator 21 webinar, I kind of walked through the, uh, the process of creating widget templates um, that we can now kind of drag and drop on this inter inter interactive uh, dashboard user interface that was developed by ARIS. So on the right, I have a few screenshots um, of examples of that kind of presentation that I gave uh, in an earlier webinar. <clears throat> so with these dashboard widgets, we can drag and drop, resize, um, even modify their definitions straight from that engineering or this dashboard interface. Um, but we can also modify those through a more standard item type definition like shown up top. So the current templates that are uh, available to you to use are grids, uh, tree grids, reports, and also custom widgets, um, which are really uh, really exciting to experiment with and um, still haven't really unlocked all the uh, capabilities of that yet. But we're also gonna have a new release of the dashboarding uh, framework, and that's gonna be in Innovator 27 as well. So that'll be an exciting, uh, exciting webinar. All right, alongside that, there's been plenty of enhancements to 3D visualization. Um, so one, just general improvements to the context menus, um, giving you a little bit more ease of use and flexibility when you're working with the tool. Um, another really exciting thing that they added was, you, was manual geometry transformation. So this really allows you to go into your models and truly interact with them. Uh, initially in 3D visualization, all you could really do is um, rotate, poke around, click on things within your model. Um, now, if you really want to, you can drag things around, resize, um, and really dig into the overall assembly um, to get a deeper, really a deeper dive into what's included in the product. Also, any sort of transformations, customizations to that assembly can be restored as a saved view. Um, so you don't need to necessarily go back and adjust everything to your liking. If there's something you need to really dive into on a certain assembly, you can maintain that view for later. And once again, the next update that we're looking for for 3D visualization is going to be um, for Innovator 27. All right, also not to be ignored, um, our user and admin experience enhancements. Uh, one of the first new things that Eris added was the table of contents editor. Uh, which was first added back all the way in Innovator 14. Um, so really the goal of this was to move our table of contents customization off of the item type definition and now into its own separate um, item within Innovator. And what this really has allowed um, is for administrators to make multiple edits to the table of contents at once. It allows um, more than just item types to appear on your table of contents, you're now able to add individual items, you can add hyperlinks to files, things of that nature um, to your tables of contents to really personalize them to however your business needs. Another thing is saved views. Um, so as a user, you can actually save default tabs upon login, say if you need access to your part tab and your in-basket. Um, you can set that as your preferred login tabs you don't have, you can save your clicks and have that open directly on login. Um, you're also able to set a preferred home screen. So in the case of, say you're making use of the ARIS dashboarding functionality, 
when you log in, you can log in directly to that custom dashboard that you built for yourself. And then alongside this, obviously, is our help text and tool tips. So as we kind of went through, um, that's new functionality that's been added for Innovator 26. So to continue off this a little bit, um, the edit and claim functionality, um, these are now separate functions uh, with newer versions of Ares. So if we take a look at this chart over here, so um, editing an item will lock the item for the duration of that edit, but will not claim that. Um, if you want to manually claim that item, you'll have to select that flag yourself. Um, another thing here is grid interactivity. It's kind of just a way to summarize some of the new functionality. Um, you can now copy and paste from within search grid cells. Um, so if you need to pull information out rather quickly and not really need to uh, do a whole AML query to pull that information out, you can just go to your search grid, um, copy and paste that metadata and pull it wherever you need to be. Um, another thing is the ability to mass update from the search grid. Um, as long as the item type you're modifying has search grid editing enabled, um, you're able to make any modifications as long as you have the permissions to make them from the search grid, there's no need to open up each individual item if you need to uh, make any modifications there. All right, so another thing here, uh, we've had some updates to the Office Connector. So there's been multiple releases of the Office Connector since Innovator 14. Uh, in rather quick summary, there's been improvements to the styling, um, added support for newer versions of the uh, Microsoft Office, error message transparency, um, added indicators for various processes, and uh, honestly, quite a bit more functionality. So if you are curious about any of those functionalities, please go back and watch some of our previous Tech Tuesdays for a little more detailed breakdown. Um, and also, we'll cover a bit of these new upgrades as well with uh, the next update to the Office Connector is looking like it's also going to be within um, Innovator Release 27. All right, and then I think our last slide like these is um, enhancements to manufacturing process planning as well as the TechDocs framework. Um, when it comes to TechDocs, we have two new APIs that have been added. So that's going to be the File Import API. Um, really provides a framework for the creation of our tech doc content by extracting data from external files. So really allows you to import a external file into your tech doc or technical documentation item within ARIS um, and really give you a baseline to start that document from. Another thing that's been added is the client API, um, which enables CUI functionality within TDF, allowing for customization of the editor. Um, so that really is pretty self-explanatory. So if you want to add maybe new context menus, new uh, um, new buttons really within the uh, Tech Docs editor, um, you'll be using the client API. Also, a lot of usability upgrades. So we've gone through a couple of these in the past. So the ability to drag and drop images into your um, technical documents without having to upload them to Ares, create a file item, things of that nature. Uh, the ability to spell check, um, image, image resizing, um, and more. So really trying to get the tech docs item within ARIS uh, to be more of a capable tech, text editor and not just a PLM tool to pull things together. Um, and then now moving on to MPP, uh, there's been various usability enhancements, um, just making things a little easier to use within uh, the MPP editor. Um, and also, since MPP and Tech Docs are kind of starting to get more closely related again, um, you're now able to use some item properties within your operations and steps on your process plans. All right, so thanks for uh, sitting through that kind of long <laughs> description of what's came in the past. Um, now we can, oh, I almost missed a slide. Um, so one last thing, uh, the notable platform changes. So one is the introduction of kind of the requirement of the WebView 2 runtime. And this is required to run any external ARIS application. So think of the batch loader, the import export tool, um, Office Connector as well. 
Um, all of these now have new login um, kind of pop-ups that come in when you use them. And these are all running on the WebView2 runtime. It's a very easy install. Um, you can just look up WebView2, download it from Microsoft's website, and it takes maybe five minutes to install. So one thing to look for, look out for, I think the requirement for it comes post 22. Um, so if you're targeting any version ahead of that, keep in mind, you'll need WebView2. Also, newer versions of Eris will also require the .NET 606 hosting bundle. bundle. Um, new platform requirement there. So that'll replace the previously required .NET 3.1.8. Um, and end of support from Microsoft ended uh, occurred on December 13th for 3.1.8. So keep that in mind if you're on a previous version of Eris. Um, Eris itself might still be supported by Eris, but some of the backend things from Microsoft and so forth um, are slowly starting to go end of life. Just so um, good idea to start getting more up to date as Eris is also starting to get more up to date as well. All right. So with that, now we can kind of get some more fun stuff, poke around in Eris and get a brief summary of a lot of the things that uh, some of you might have missed or might have forgotten about over the last year or so of Eris. All right, so to begin, let's start at the kind of the newest thing that we've covered, and that's going to be uh, tool tips on our item type. I just want to go over rather quickly how these are created, how they're used, um, so on and so forth. So you'll notice on our demo environment here, you probably are familiar with a uh, good old MakerBot replicator. Um, you might notice from our screenshots, we have these two um, question marks. So in our example here, on the type property, we have a we have help text. Um, and through help text, it's really more intended for larger blocks of text. So say there's extended documentation about a specific property in your environment. Um, help text is useful since it'll pull up this dialog box. You can really, there's really no character limit here. You can add as much as you need um, to walk, either walk users through what a property is really needed for, or say if you have a lot of new users in your environment, this can be a pretty useful tool. And then when it comes to tool tips, these are really short tidbits of text uh, to maybe do a quick description of a property. Uh, kind of funny, we're doing a description of long description here, and our description is a text string described in our part here. So to include these in your um, in any specific item type, it is rather easy. So if I go to our part item type in Eris, these are just a new attribute on a property. So if we were to go to say description, scroll over, we now have two new attributes at the end here, and those are tool tip and help text. So for either, really all you need to do is go ahead and Type whatever tech you really need. Um, so in this case, for item number, let's say it's auto-generated. And go ahead and save this. Close out our part form, reopen it. And now we'll have our little tidbit of information about our part number. So say if the user is confused, why is my part number field grayed out? I need to fill this out. Um, you can give a little bit of context on why certain things may not be available to a user. Um, so pretty quick to add to your environment and definitely useful and can save a lot of questions. So alongside that, if we go to our search grid for parts, uh, we also now have a new question mark under each of these properties if we'd like. All right. So with that, um, kind of staying in the admin space here, Let's go ahead and take a quick review of the table of contents editor. Um, so on previous versions of Eris, um, to kind of do this configuration, this was all located on the single item type. So if I wanted to add, say, for example, parts to the table of contents, I would have to open the part item type, um, adjust the talk access and where it was located on the table of contents um, directly from that item type. And if I wanted to add something more, for example, products, I would also have, I would go to, sorry, I would have to go to each individual item type and do that there. So now with this new functionality, 
if I want to add a new item type, it's almost as simple as adding a relationship um, to any sort of item type in Eris. So I'm just going to pick something at random. For example, the customer item type, if I want to add that within our design tab, I can go ahead, double click that. I can adjust on whose table of contents um, customers will show up on. So in this case, probably don't want only admins to see this. We can say everyone in our environment can see our customer list. Um, go ahead and save that. So now if I were to go to my table of contents, I'd now have customers within our design tab. If I want to remove it, simple as clicking that X and uh, saving our changes. So we're also able to add individual items and forms to our table of contents. Say there's a part that's rather important or a specific um, item, say the ECN form we wanna to add to our um, table of contents. A user can go ahead and launch an ECN and take a look at that form directly from their table of contents. Um, one more thing, if I wanted to add a specific page, so in this case, an HTML page, it can be a link to something. Um, I can also add those here as well. And then on top of form pages, I can also add individual items. So, There you go. So if I wanted to say add a specific part directly to our table of contents, um, we've been working with MP101 for a while. We can go ahead and add that, say, to our... No, we'll keep it there for now. But if I go save that and take a look at my table of contents, we'll now have MPO 101 at the bottom there. All right, so with that, we can also now go and take a quick uh, review of a few other things like variant management, dashboards, 3D visualization. Um, so first, let's go ahead and take a look at variant management and uh, do a quick click through. So let's take a look at our bicycle. So a quick review of variant management. Um, we're able, there are a few different item types that are built into the, uh, the uh, component or the platform component here. Um, so we have our rel relevant features that are part of our variability items. Um, so each of these, so the bicycle here is a variability item. Each of these individual variability items will have uh, a structure underneath it. Um, and relevant features as well. And the conditions on which each one of these components can be added to say our top level bicycle in this case, um, are they are dictated by these rule sets that are created here. So these are all real just conditional rules here. Um, so in this case, if our bike is a fat bike, then our handlebar type will have to be this flat bar. And these rules can kind of go into place here as we go ahead and kind of click through our variability structure. So when we select fat bike here, for example, we already see that our only option for handlebar type will be the flat bar. We only have one handlebar width. We have to use disc brakes or a, and a hydraulic disc brake lever. So if I were to select one of these alternatives here, it's going to remove that our bicycle type is a fat bike. It'll it'll basically reset our whole configuration and give us our proper um, give us the selections that would be compatible with that specific handlebar type. So in this case, we can only use road bikes. We can be any size we'd like. Um, let's go ahead and select some options. And as you can tell, um, as we select these options and begin to fill out this structure, we get a summary of the build. Um, and this can go ahead and be passed on to uh, say manufacturing floor or so on and so forth and um, go ahead and construct that configuration. So alongside that, we have dashboards. I just wanna give a 
quick poke through at the dashboard item. That. So that's going to be under my innovator. So this is a quick dashboard that I pulled up earlier just with one widget, um, mainly just so I can kind of show the drag and drop functionality um, and uh, as well as kind of look at a few of the configuration things that we can take a look at um, within each individual widget. So once again, there's a few different types of widgets. You can add search grids like this one here is um, the search grid that comes up when you open up your in basket. Um, you can go ahead and do tree grid views, say if you were, for example, looking for members of a specific team, say this is our engineering team, we can do a tree grid view and run a query on that and add that to a dashboard as well. Or if there's a specific report related to any of this information, um, we can link those as well through the creation of widgets. So dashboards can be created by users. Um, so that can be done just by going into dashboards, creating a new one, kind of similar to self-service reporting. But when it comes to the creation of widgets, those are going to be located within the administration tab. And those are located also under configuration here. Um, so Ferris provides you with a couple uh, templates to get you started on creating these widgets. Um, so we have our grid template, which the My Tasks widget that I made was created out of. Um, and poke around at that really quickly. So there's a few properties that you're going to have to locate. Um, nice update since the last time we walked through the dashboarding item type. You no longer have to go and find a specific lid of an item to include it here. You can actually go and search for the specific item type you're looking to refer, um, refer to within this widget which is a nice comfort feature. Um, definitely makes things a lot easier. Um, we also have report templates, um, really configured the same way. You need to find your report, the item type you're reporting on, um, and the specific item that the report is related to. Um, and pretty much follows the same pattern for the tree grids as well. All right, so I figured for our last little bit of functionality here, Let's go ahead and finish off with something exciting and fun, um, and that being 3D visualization. So today we're gonna be looking at this stepper motor assembly, um, which is a kind of a small piece to our larger um, MakerBot 3D printer assembly. Um, so uh, when we're taking a look at this assembly, we see we can do our normal, let's see what's my view. We can do our normal um, rotate. Um, sorry, let's talk for a second. We can do our normal rotate translation, things of that nature. Um, but another thing that's been added is the ability to go ahead and actually select an individual component. Um, and if you right click on it, yep, it'll bring up a context menu here um, where you can see there's a couple new options that have been added. So we're able to move relative to an axis, relative to a reference. So in this case, let's go ahead and move relative to an axis. So maybe we can see how this motor fits into this gear that's driving this belt. Um, we can make measurements, we can check clearances, things of that nature um, using the tool. I can also go ahead and say rotate this gear upon this axis, this one maybe break our assembly a little bit. But if we go ahead and select reset view, um, everything will snap back into the uh, locations that we want. So quick review, we're also able to go ahead and do cross-section views. So to flip our plane. Um, either way, yeah, we're able to do cross-sections. We're able to um, do exploded views as well using the 3D visualization tool. Um, so a lot of fun, uh, flashy functionality there that's going to be really useful for really just examining your CAD models directly from within PLM. There's no need to go back to SolidWorks to really check a quick measurement or see how an assembly goes together and things of that nature. So with that, that's a pretty quick run through um, obviously, we could have 
dove in a little more on some of those things, but do have a limited amount of time today. So um, if there are any questions or if there's anything you're curious about seeing based on the new functionality um, or anything that might ne not necessarily be new or you're curious about, free feel to reach out to us and we can walk you through about through any of uh, these new features that Eris has added to uh, Innovator. Um, so with that, we'll hand it off to see if there's any questions from the audience here. Hey, Milan. So yeah, we do have a few questions that came in while you were doing some of the demos. So let's go through them. Um, let's see. On the one we just looked at, uh, we got a question from Angela. I wonder if we can use the dashboards for some kind of PLM news page. Is it possible to use them for displaying the regular notifications, messages, or custom content like links to helpful resources? Yeah, so that might be accomplishable through the custom widgets. Um, so Eris is targeting a lot of new functionality with um, their kind of dashboarding framework there. So um, in the future, I'm sure they'll have the ability to maybe add a secure social kind of tab within their discussion posts, abilities, things of that nature. Um, but that, once again, that also is something that might be accomplishable just through using that custom widget template. Um, there's really not a lot of documentation there right now. Um, so it might just be a fun, maybe pet project just to go ahead and kind of see what you can do. Just um, go in, make references to things that might not specifically work. Um, but at this point, a lot of it's still uh, in development and it might be some of the things where the Ares community goes and kind of create some of the things on their own. Okay, um, great, thanks Milan. Uh, next question is, I was kind of, I was referring to the, the earlier part of your demo. Regarding help text properties, can I add more advanced HTML elements like links, colors, and some basic styling? Yeah, so that is actually something I experimented uh, earlier today because um, I was curious about the same thing. Um, when I try to add a specific hyperlink, um, I think at the moment how things are configured with the tooltip properties, um, the the HTML that I included kind of got mixed in with Eris's HTML that's driving uh, the tooltips, and it was sort of breaking things a little bit. Um, so not at the moment, um, but hopefully that's something they'll see as a bug and make some modifications to. Because I think having hyperlinks and things of that nature would be extremely valuable. Okay, great. Um, from Dennis, how do you use the link on the tooltip to open up the pop to open the pop-up window like classification slash type property? Yeah, so in this case, if I go and open up our form, um, when you highlight the question mark, it's just a hyperlink where you select it and it'll open up that uh that window. Okay. Let's get more questions here. Hold on. I lost my mouse. There we go. All right. Um, do you know anything about the new responsive from designer mentioned in the roadmap? I'm sorry, what was that? Do you know anything about the new responsive form designer mentioned in the roadmap? Uh, I have not seen anything about that yet, um, but as soon as it gets released, I'll be excited to play with it and get that up. Uh, information out to you guys. Okay. Um, on the MPP, does the link link tech docs to MBOM? I think the question there is, um, I think what they're looking for is, can we link the technical documentation to the manufacturing, uh, to the MBOM in MPP? Yeah. Yes, that's, <clears throat> that's something we've done as part of the services plan with a number of customers. As well as you know, e bomb to m bomb tech docs to both. That's actually something we're exploring with a few clients right now as well. Okay. Um, anything else? Anyone else has any other questions? Dennis has make, is making a comment um, about modeling the news as an item, and then we could show them in in a search widget to address some of Angela's questions about adding news to the dashboard. Yeah, we've done as as part of some 
the reporting is always a hot topic. And then there's the self-service reporting that's within ARIS, um, as well as some of the stuff that we've done as part of you know, SSRS, SQL reporting services, or a data warehouse. So really, um, there's a lot that's possible there and that we've done via, you know, and via services projects with clients. I think it's just a matter of, you know, getting getting some good requirements for what you, what exactly you want to be on that dashboard. Um, if it's all internal ARIS data, there is a way to create, you know, either a custom item type or sort of a custom landing page for when the user comes into ARIS and you can display, you know, all that information available via the API. We could go through and show those. Um, another approach we've taken to this is when a customer has a number of big data metrics that they want to be able to report on, we'll develop those reports to a web page or a you know, custom web page that's drawing information out of ARIS. And then they can get to those reports in there too. So think of a dashboard where you enter and you have like the important metrics for you uh, right, right at the get-go, like right when you enter that page and then links to important uh, other important reports um, from that landing page. So there's there's a lot possible there. Um, so I, if that's something that um, you know, you're really interested in pursuing, I would definitely reach out to Milan and myself. Okay, um, can you demo adding help text possibly, Milan? Uh, yeah, sure. I kind of realized when I was going through the demonstration, I only showed how tool tips were created. Um, so let's go back to our item type here. So once again, these help text and tooltip, they're new uh, attributes that are added to properties here in our item type. So let's maybe put help text in our part number instead of a tooltip. So the help text is created essentially the same way, except instead of filling out the string within the little grid for the attributes, um, a big text dialog box will actually appear and show up for you. So this is also the area where I try to add HTML and things of that nature into. Um, I figured it might be able to handle it. But um, once again, I think that might just be a bug with the initial release of this. But if I wanted to make a help text, um, so what number? And say we can put a whole description of our how our part numbers are generated, things of that nature within this uh, help text. Um, so I can go ahead and save our item type, go back to part. Um, and when you create help text, what it will do is automatically create this link to show more and open up that text dialog box. Um, and when I click that, that's where the text I applied during the, well, while I was within the item type, um, that's where that text would show. When I collect, select them. So they're both configured basically identically. Uh, one just has kind of more capacity for information versus the other. Okay, great. Uh, any more questions? I am not seeing any more questions. Um, one more question. Can you demonstrate copy and paste from clipboard? I haven't seen it yet. Um, I know custom variants, but wonder how Aris solved it. Ah, uh, yeah. So that's thing. Yeah, I definitely uh, rushed past. So in terms of going from a grid, being able to copy and paste from there, um, one will need to make this part um, or the part item type. Uh, modifiable from the search grid. So to do that, I must go to preferences, go to my world preferences, um, edit in grid, and here you can see there's already a few item types pre-configured to do that. Um, but if I want to, I'll go make part modifiable from grid. So sorry if I went through those clicks rather quickly. So to do that, you need to go to preferences, um, when you're within preferences, um, granted, you can apply these to whatever user you'd like. Um, but in this case, I selected world, so all users in my environment. 
will now be able to edit part in search grid. So now let's reopen our parts search here. Um, and in this case, now I can go in, log out actually for that to apply. Yep. So now when we're in this grid, we can actually go through multi-select or let's go to things like pro parent actually. So now um, I can go in multi-select and actually interact with the data that's within each of these, um, within each of these cells. So if I wanted to, I can highlight, copy uh, whatever I need, um, as well as if I were to, C. Um, for example, if I were to control C on a specific field here, um, I can also uh, say copy and paste the name of this part, paste it within this field and kind of do mass update in that sense. So kind of uh, killed two birds with one stone there. So sorry if that was confusing. Um, but just to show the mass edit ability, um, if I were to make edits to all those individual components and I select save, it would save all of them at the same time um, and then once again to demonstrate i can copy and paste add things to the clipboard from our um, search grid i'll just paste it up here in the enterprise search bar um, just to demonstrate that i pulled this directly out of here and up there so when you do copy things so if i wanted to say copy a grid um, should highlight the individual cell that was selected at the time all right, so hopefully that answered your question. Um, and I know I kind of expanded on that as well. <laughs> yes, um, just look here. Yes. Do you have to enable grid editing for copying? Um, yeah, so I think that one probably came in while I was going through all of that. Um, no, so these are all released parts. They don't, they're not able to be edited right now. Um, I can go ahead and copy directly from Bell and go and paste as I need. Great, and one last question was, uh, are R26 used for this demo? Yep, this is uh, Innovator 26. Perfect. Great, excellent questions, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, the participation. Okay, we're gonna move on to the close. Yep. Right, he's got a few things he wants to mention. Yeah, very good. First, uh, yeah, let me echo Julianne and thanking everybody for making it out to another Tech Tuesday. We've been, uh, you know, fill, filled our time slot today, and it was <clears throat> great to see so much interaction. So our attendance has been ever increasing for this. So I, we definitely appreciate that. Uh, a few things ahead of us. So we have the Aris subscriber user group coming up March 24th. So all the sub Aris uh, Razor Leaf subscribers on the line. Um, we're going to be looking at change management. So sort of going back into the wheelhouse of PLM. Um, we've got a couple customers that are going to help us with that, and we're looking forward to a lot of good uh, general conversation there. We haven't seen those folks since the end of last quarter, so that'll be a great event. And then um, we really want to get out there for everyone, the Aris Ace Conference, May 1st through 3rd in Orlando, Florida. Um, that's always a fantastic event. We're super excited, as well as uh, you know, Aris is, too, to be able to get that event back in person um, for our if you do plan to attend that event, um, definitely let us know. I think we have a pretty good, uh, pretty good group of Razor Leaf folks that are going to be out there. Myself, Dennis, Milan, uh, Julianne, and uh, our president and VP of Sales will be out there as well. Uh, we'd love to know that you're going to be there, just so uh, we can at least run in and you know maybe maybe uh, grab something at cocktail hour and have conversations about where you're headed for PLM. Um, with that being said, our next Tech Tuesday will be June 6th. Um, by then we'll have release 27 and as Milan's alluded to looking at the roadmap uh, there should be a lot of great things to cover uh, particularly with some of the improvements to variant management and dashboards which both came up today uh, we've had some active conversations with clients with here over the last quarter so just want to thank Milan for giving us a good presentation today and keeping up with our questions thank Julianne for facilitating and thank all of you for uh, making it out to another Tech Tuesday so thank you and have a good have a good rest of your week and weekend.
great. Thanks, everyone. Recording will be coming your way shortly. Take care. Great. Thank you. Thanks.